Welcome to City Inside Out Council Edition. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. How will four newly elected council members impact the Seattle City Council? When might the passage of State Initiative 976 affect our local transportation system? And how is the city planning to spend its $6.5 billion budget? Council members Lorena Gonzalez and Mike O'Brien join me to answer these questions and the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. Without 976 passing, we already needed more transit. You know what we currently have right now? Probation. It's not working. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And here we go with Council Member Lorena Gonzalez and Mike O'Brien. Thank you very much for being here. And I wanted to start off by telling people we are taping the show right as election results are getting certified by King County Elections and voters have chosen four new members for the Seattle City Council. So the three incumbents, of course, kept their seats. Many observers have said we have one of the most progressive councils we've ever seen. And Lorena, I know you've heard the pundits saying the political alliances are forming. We know how this council is going to vote, etc. How do you react to that? What is your approach going to be to a very new, very progressive city council? Um, well, I think we have um, a good opportunity to, um, as I like to describe it, it's, it's a new chapter for the city council. Um, it's sort of as new as 2015 was. It's an opportunity for us to... Um, figure out how we're going to work and, and really come together and develop um, a list, a comprehensive list of legislative priorities that will advance the work of the city council um, through the next year. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about the folks that I'm going to have an opportunity to work with mm -hmm. next year. Really sad, of course, to lose some of mm -hmm. my uh, current colleagues, but really looking forward to the promise of uh, working with a, a really progressive city council who is also truly committed to delivering on the solutions that um, people who are struggling to um, you know stay and yeah. and and prosper in Seattle are yeah. experiencing today so I think there's there's a lot of excitement um, for me and I think there's a lot of excitement for the city as a whole do you see those voting blocks forming though I know a lot of people have, have expressed concerns about that you know I, I, in my experience you know we currently have a very progressive city council yeah. We all tend to be independent thinkers, um, and we get a bad rap for being ideologues. I don't think that that's the case at all. I think we take our job very seriously. We we weigh the issues, the facts, and what our options are before us, and um, and then we we vote accordingly. So I suspect that 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 will continue to be the case for the future council. Okay. And Mike, I know you're leaving office after this year, <laughs> and I, I did want to point out, though, I think your push for democracy vouchers a few years ago seemed to really yield some results. And two, and two pieces here. More than 50 candidates ran for council positions this November, as you know. And we're also six years in on this vote-by-district system. It appeared to me that this concept of a locally focused and locally funded candidate might have had some dividends this year. Did you see it that way? I do. I mean, it's, it's great to see so many candidates running. Um, it can also be terrifying yeah. when you try <laughs> to figure lot, out how it is. To take on. But for d our democracy in our city, I think it's an amazing thing. And really excited. You know, Councilmember Gonzalez was on the Ethics and Election Committee right. way back when we started yeah. talking about this. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's, it is important for the city to continue to think about how our democracy works because it does impact that. There was a time when you hardly had any credible candidates running. Um, and now you have a ton of folks running. That gives the people a lot of choice, and that's great. Got it. Lorraine, I wanted to follow up with the new council. I'm counting at least five members who have supported, as council members or candidates, the concept of a head tax on Seattle's bigger businesses. Mm -hmm. Is this something you'd anticipate the council looking at next year? Are there lessons learned? We had a viewer write in just recently on this via Instagram. How are we going to be able to reduce homelessness without revenue sources like the head tax? Any thoughts on that? I mean, I think that there is obviously based on things that, that uh, candidates said on the trail, there's a strong interest to look at, at revenue streams to meet uh, the needs, the ongoing needs of um, the city of Seattle. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think it, next year will be a, a unique opportunity for us to have a conversation about what some of those revenue tools could be. I think I've heard loudly and clearly both from constituents and from these, from the, the council member elects that they'd like to stay away from regressive taxation models, which include sales and property tax. Those are the ones that hit working families the hardest. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that 
there'll be an opportunity for us to consider what it would look like to uh, potentially frame up a conversation around um, the head tax or call it something else, mm -hmm. but but uh, a new revenue stream that yeah. can help us address the issues. We obviously just saw the passage of 976. Right. That has huge impacts yeah. for us as a city and for mm -hmm. the people who live and work here. I think there's an opportunity for us to take a look at whether we have have a revenue tool available to us yeah. to meet the needs that are created as a result of the passage of 976. Yeah. And, you know, if we assume that we we don't win that lawsuit. Yeah, right. There will still be an ongoing need, particularly around transit services mm -hmm. that we know we need and that we know Seattleites absolutely want more of. Yeah. And Mike, I'll just follow up on what Councilmember Gonzalez is talking about here with 976, basically carving a $30 million hole or so in the transportation budget here. It looks like the council's not making any big changes just yet. I mean, in terms of its budget, when we're right around the corner here with wrapping that up, tell me why not? Why not backfill that? And then let's talk short-term, long-term impacts of 976, if indeed it does survive these court challenges. Yeah. I mean, starting the reason we haven't made any changes is one, we think it's illegal. Um, 976, and so we um, are currently pressing to say, please suspend that and allow us to continue to collect revenue until that court case works out. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, frankly, the alternative is really horrific for folks, especially for folks that rely on transit. Um, it's going to be some um, cuts to services that will affect, frankly, the, the most vulnerable folks, um, often the people that aren't working nine to five banker hours, but yeah. working evenings and weekends who live in places where they're transit dependent. And, you know, it's just something that's unacceptable. And so, um, you know, we will continue to work with the courts and see what we're told and want to work with our state legislature to find new revenue options too, because frankly, uh, without 976 passing, we already needed more transit. Yeah. Those buses are full. We got more and more people moving to the city that want more and more access to transit. Got it. And Lorraine, may maybe I can have you chime in here. <clears throat> Any concerns about not really back backfilling this 976 gap in the 2020 budget? You know, I continue to believe that we need every single cent that is provided to us that 976 purports to cut. Um, these are real transit projects. There are real services. Um, in addition to impacting and having a devastating impact to the working class, we know that seniors and disabled riders will also be some of the most significantly um, uh, impacted populations in our city. Mm -hmm. So we have an obligation to, to deliver on those services as a basic function of, of what we do as a city government. And we fundamentally believe that 976 is illegal, and we believe and, and hope that the courts will agree with us. And until then, um, we're going to continue to uh, charge forward and meet the needs that we know exist until we're told that we're unable to do that. And when that happens, we yeah. will be faced with a significant revenue um, shortfall to, to meet some of these um, really important transportation needs. Thank you for touching on that. I want to round out our talk about the election with uh, a talk about your bill, this political action committee campaign finance reform. You introduced this concept back in August. I think it's very important to point that out. Yeah. This is even before we saw this record amount of money go into the November city elections by Amazon, the chamber, some union groups too. Your bill would set a maximum $5,000 donation to a single pack, would prohibit campaign donations from foreign influenced companies. Why do we need this? How do you deal with the free speech concerns over a bill like this? And where do we go from here? Well, I think that um, this this bill, the Clean Campaigns Act, is really critical to protecting our democracy. And one of the things that was really inspiring to me in 2015 was the passage of the Democracy Voucher yeah. Program. And we saw that in an overwhelming number of Seattle voters voted in favor of that on the promise that it would shift campaigns and our democracy's focus onto voters and away from big corporate dollar donors. We, now that we've had a couple of cycles, have seen that it hasn't quite worked out that way, unfortunately. And part of that is because independent expenditures, super PACs, yeah. are largely unregulated in our city. This, uh, this act, the Clean Campaigns Act, offers us an opportunity to impose reasonable regulations to deal with the appearance of corruption. Mm -hmm. I've heard time and time in the context of this election mm -hmm. that people have real concerns about how corruption is creeping in and impacting our local elections. That 
to me is pretty clear that the Constitution and the Supreme Court will allow cities like Seattle to step in and regulate in those spaces where there is a fear of appearance of corruption in our local elections. So this is really about not uh, not um, you know trying to unreasonably restrict first speech, mm -hmm. First Amendment speech, mm -hmm. but about putting in reasonable regulations that will um, that will make sure that people, the voters, are being focused on in a way that's consistent with on, with the Democracy Voucher Program, right. in a way that's consistent with the Constitution. I know it's going to be legally challenged, so thank you for laying out those arguments. Mike, I remember talking with you about this uh, four years ago when we were talking about <laughs> Democracy Vouchers. Do we need a bill like this? Can we truly take big money out of politics? we got to keep trying. You know, that big money is going to keep trying to find its way in, and I think Councilmember Gonzalez's bill is, is an awesome first step yeah. um, in doing that. And, um, you know, we all care about the First Amendment and our right to free speech. And um, over generations, the courts have put very targeted limits on that. And this is a very appropriate limit. We're balancing our right to a free democracy, which is under threat, not just at the city level, frankly, but everywhere. Sure. Mm -hmm. And a reasonable approach that allows people to continue to express their opinions, but not turn our electoral system into this cynical money fight where, you know, it effectively turns off the rest, most of the people to playing in it because it's no longer their game anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's when our, our, corpor our, our democracy is taken over by people who have money. So this is an yeah. absolutely right thing to do. Yeah. And um, I have faith that the courts will find a way to support it. An important discussion to have. I'm going to move to the budget. Mike, you first here. I'm going to put a spotlight on the council's move to put three and a half million more dollars towards LEAD, Law mm -hmm. Enforcement Assisted Diversion. This is a program that keeps low level, low level offenders out of jail, supposed to link them up with services. But you've heard from groups like the Downtown Seattle Association, which do support LEAD. They are saying, they're saying we need other options. A lot of low level criminals continue to cycle through the system. I know the mayor has been calling for emphasis patrols recently on shoplifting. We've had some people writing on an Instagram. When are you going to support small businesses in Seattle? What do you think of this pushback from businesses and what's this investment in LEAD going to do? Sure. You know, um, I hear the pushback from both businesses and residents um, on a regular basis. And I, I understand the frustrations they see when um, whether it's just the, the physical appearance of disorderly or it's actual, you know, theft that's happening yep. or, or vandalism that's yep. happening. Um, and we have a bunch of solutions that, that don't work. Mm -hmm. You know, continually arresting people, um, putting them through the cycle doesn't work. Our economic system is broken. Um, the fact that we have, uh, you know, we're one of the richest cities in the world, and we also have the, some of the highest rates of homelessness speaks to a failed system. And if we don't spend most of our energy trying to fix that system, the band-aids we're putting on will never be enough. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, fixing that system is a big problem. It's going to require some national leadership, which we don't have right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're left with doing band-aids, and LEAD um, does some amazing, has some amazing tools. Mm -hmm. When I listen to the complaints of folks like um, the downtown Seattle Association or other business leaders, um, they'll often point to a report of the, you know, hundred, um, you know, the, most... The system failure report, the, the right. Most, the most, uh, the folks that are most accessing the criminal justice system. Yes. You know, we look at that list and the folks at LEAD have looked at it. And I think of those hundred, um, as I recall, like five or six were enrolled in LEAD and almost all of them would be eligible for LEAD. Mm -hmm. But... LEAD is not funded enough. They're already over capacity. Mm -hmm. They can't take new referrals. Yeah. So I actually think by putting a significant increase in funding to lower the caseloads with our existing caseworkers and rapidly expand the ability of more and more officers to refer people to this program, we actually will be addressing that. Okay. Um, but let's not get distracted that if we don't change the big system, yeah. we will be constantly putting more and more millions into a system that we frankly we shouldn't need. Yeah, and, and just following up on this, Lorena, one idea that came up from the mayor, some municipal court judges, too, was this concept of enhanced probation. Judge Ed McKenna wrote in an op-ed recently on this. When Seattle citizens are calling for leadership around public safety and looking for solutions that help high-need individuals who cycle through the criminal justice system, we need a spectrum of approaches that includes probation. I know the council has approved studying this idea in the recent budget process, but not adding <clears throat> more funding to it, as I understand it. I wanted to ask why not, because some judges are saying this could be a good tool. Well, with all due respect to Judge McKenna, I I couldn't disagree with him more. Uh, probation is is a direct funnel back into mass incarceration. A, a result of of not complying with probation is jail. Um, so I think that 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 while I agree that we need a spectrum of options, we also need a spectrum of options that we have a high level of confidence are going to work. Yeah. Uh, you know what we currently have right now? Probation. 
it's not working. Uh, people are still cycling in and out of jail in spite of an existing probation program. And while I agree that the court system uh, has a probation system now that is, it, it creates less harm than mm -hmm. in other contexts, uh, it still creates harm. And it is still a pathway back to jail if you do not comply with X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So when we're talking about the hardest to serve population, right. the population that need, has the most significant needs yeah. to think that putting the burden on them of complying with even more requirements right. is going to be successful, I think is foolish. I, I think there's a challenge of accountability here. I guess you'd probably hear it from the judges and other people too. Who's accountable at the end of the day for these people who continue to offend? Well, I mean, I think I, I, I reject this this argument, frankly. Okay. I mean, I think that I think that the criminal justice system has a responsibility to um, to to exercise their their discretion in mm -hmm. uh, metting out sentences and determining if people are guilty or not. And, and that's a different question. Okay. Now, we as a city government, not a court system, not a judicial system, but as elected officials representing the interests of the people of the city, we have an obligation to make sure that the basic needs of people are met. And we are failing this, this, this part of our population in the sense that that not only are we not funding things like lead at the scale that need to be funded, we also don't have a place to send folks so that they can stabilize and avoid engaging in survival behavior that is oftentimes of criminal nature. Yeah. But when you're hungry and you haven't eaten all day, you're going to make choices to survive. Mm -hmm. And that oftentimes means shoplifting. It means stealing food to fill your belly. Mm -hmm. When you are, when you have a substance use disorder, you need to figure out how to survive. Right. And and our response to that shouldn't be we're going to throw you in jail, and forget about you. It should be what are we going to do to invest in mental health systems yeah. and substance use disorder, and in transitional housing yeah. to allow people an opportunity to be safe and yeah. secure and to focus on getting uh, themselves out of unhealthy situations that exist in the street. And this is an issue that, Mike, did you have I, something? I, yeah. I mean, how you even ask that question, mm -hmm. Brian, is really sets up the types of answer you get. And, Fair enough, okay. And I, and I think that, um, you know, we all need to be held accountable, absolutely. But uh, simply stopping there makes it sound like, you know, the difference between Mike O'Brien and the person mm -hmm. on the list of 100 offenses is somehow just in their DNA and I'm a more accountable person. I see. You look at the, the, the cards that I've been dealt um, and, you know, I don't get up in the morning thinking like, maybe I'll try meth or heroin today. You know, you look at folks that are in this system and inevitably there are massive crises that have come upon them. And those are crises that we as a society need to figure out how to solve. Um, and simply saying, well, this person needs to be held accountable for their behavior. We as a society need to be held accountable for allowing the systems in place that put that in place. And when you ask the question that way, mm -hmm. all of a sudden we start saying, where do we invest? Where do we invest in these folks? How do we minimize the harm that's being done to the individuals and community, which programs like LEAD can do? Mm -hmm. um, but how do we invest in society so we don't have this problem next time? Thank you. And Mike, I'll stay with you. I know the issue of homelessness intersects with this issue very closely in terms of what we're talking about here. I wanted to talk about navigation team funding. It's one of the prime ways the city interacts with homeless people in unauthorized encampments. I know Council Member Sawant wanted to defund this team completely. The council is not going to be doing that. But there are some concerns about this team going forward. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Should the navigation team be expanded? What results are you expecting from this team in the future? Um, you know, this is one of those areas where it's been really challenging for me as a council member to legislate through the budget <laughs> what I think needs to happen on day-to-day -day decisions, starting with the mayor, mm -hmm. but all the way down through the staff that reports to who are making yeah. decisions uh, at encampment. So our police um, have a role to play in solving this crisis. Um, there are certain things that people can't be doing, and when they step over that line, even though it may be the circumstances that put them there, um, the, the you know, police need to step in and make sure that harm's not being done to you know, those individuals, other homeless people, people that are housed, businesses. Right. So they have a role to play in this. Um, I think the, the level at which we've been sweeping people um, is completely inappropriate. Um, we simply do not have enough shelters or housing. Um, and there's a bit of a game that gets played. Mm -hmm. As long as we have a few options on a given night, we'll go sweep 50 people out of a place and say, well, we offered some options, but nobody took them. 
Um, I never hear from anyone saying, hey, we have a bunch of shelter beds that are open. Let's fill them up. A bunch of housing options. No one's filling them up. We need to build radically more. And then what do we do with the people that are outside? Um, if they're in a place that's inappropriate, we need to find appropriate places for them to go. And simply making them an offer that is likely not acceptable or we haven't done the work to explain and um, saying, well, why don't you go over there? And they're like, that doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. They're just going to go camp somewhere else. And then we right. sweep them again. That, yeah. that is a waste of our resources. It's a reaction, um, frankly, when we don't have the right tools in place mm -hmm. and a neighborhood group is frustrated or a business is frustrated. Yeah. We want to respond. Their frustrations are real. Mm -hmm. And when the only tool you have is I'll send the police out and sweep them. Yeah. Um, it, it feels like a good tool at the moment sometimes, but right. it really doesn't solve it. And the solution is not more navigation team, but more of the housing options. Well, and, and this team is made up of housing, or excuse me, human, human services department, the police, parks is involved as well. There are yeah. some other agencies involved. Yeah. And, 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 you know, for a long time, um, we contracted with REACH, which are yeah. these amazing outreach workers, and they've stopped participating because they said, for us to do our work, we need time to develop relationships with yeah. the individuals. And when you come in and say you got an hour's notice, yeah. we can't do our work legitimately. And, yeah. and frankly, we feel like a front for something that we disagree with. So they've pulled out of that work, too. And so yeah. we got to honor that, too. Uh, Lorena, your thoughts about the NAV team going forward? Um, well, I, I don't think it should be expanded at this point. Um, I think that, uh, but I also, like Councilmember O'Brien, am not ready to um, take a vote to completely eliminate it mm -hmm. either. I think that um, the 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 title of this thing, navigation team, it's inherent in the title that we're navigating people to a better place. Right. Unfortunately, what we're seeing from the statistics. And, and that does happen sometimes, not well, all the time. Well, no, 8% yeah. yeah. is their success rate. Okay. And, um, and so I think that that's a problem. Yeah. Um, so we expect, as a result of council legislation, that there will be performance from our nonprofit service providers in terms of placement and referrals into appropriate housing options or shelter options. Mm -hmm. That percentage is very high. It is much higher. Many of our agencies are performing at about the 60% success rate. Right. Our navigation team is 8%. So 8% of the people that they come in contact with every day are successfully connecting with some sort of offer to shelter or housing. Mm -hmm. That number is dismal. So. I have a significant amount of questions, and I think this is an appropriate place to bring up the yeah. word accountability, sure. uh, as opposed to the prior conversation we okay. were having. But I think that I think that uh, you know, if 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 what the goal here with the navigation team is to just sweep people around the city and move them from one side of the street to the other side of the street to provide momentary relief, then perhaps the executive should be honest that that is what the theory of change is. But we should not be selling this as a as a tool to effectively, meaningfully, at a high rate of return, connect people with services that they so desperately need, because I'm not seeing that the statistics are supporting that narrative. Okay, thank you both for the discussion on the budget. Lorena, I'm gonna pick up the pace slightly and draw on your background as an attorney as we move forward here. So the state Supreme Court just upheld the city's first come, first served mm -hmm. law, which is, the, yeah, there he goes. <laughs> it's the city's effort to take bias out of the rental process. I wanted to talk about that briefly. And do you think this bodes well for the city's case on its income tax law? Another matter I know it wants the Supreme Court to look at. Yeah, well, obviously every body of law is gonna be looked at a little differently by the court system. But I think that the, the first in time uh, legislation that really is fundamentally about removing bias and discrimination out of our housing system mm -hmm. uh, was an important victory for us. When we passed that legislation, we, we, we got a lot of heat for it, um, saying that it was going to be categorically unconstitutional, which seems to be the go-to answer these days when people <clears throat> don't want us to pass laws. I'm hopeful about our income tax um, uh, litigation. I think um, I think that we have a strong defense of that. And and again, you know, when we're talking about having the most upside-down tax system in the state, this case is absolutely critical to lighting a fire under our uh, under ourselves to to really try to figure out how to how to do better as it relates to taxation for the middle class. Thank you, and Mike, I'm going to let Woohoo stand as your comments for that one. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to move on here, but from the That's mailbag. A speed round. That, here we go. Here we go. I have a question about bike shares and scooter shares from one of our viewers. With a countywide helmet requirement, shouldn't a helmet selfie be at the start of every bike share ride? The scooter share bird, I know, has been talking about this with regard to taking these selfies. Any thoughts on how to encourage people to use helmets as the city considers scooter sharing in the near future here? Yeah. 
No, the helmet's a tricky one. Um, <laughs> um, I wear a helmet pretty much everywhere I go when I bike. I couldn't and, even tell. But yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, one of the challenges is um, we're trying to address mobility, and we want to give people lots of easy options. And that means, you know, you walk out the door, I'm running late for a meeting, hey, here's a scooter, here's a bike, here's mm -hmm. a right. taxi, here, whatever it is, you have lots of great options. Unfortunately, most people don't have a helmet with them. And um, we haven't figured out a great system where you can just grab a helmet to go. Um, I've seen uh, designs of collapsible folding helmets that you might be able to stick in your pocket, but they haven't passed certification yet. So um, there's a trade-off between um, what are the things that we impose as personal safety. We also know that one of the most deadly ways of being around uh, is, is the automobile. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of safety features, but that is a big, heavy piece of equipment. If everyone in our city were taking um, scooters everywhere instead of cars, um, they would be much safer with or without helmets. And yeah. so um, it's a tricky question. I encourage everyone to ride helmets. I think we have to continue to look at this as the big picture of what's safe and what's also addressing our mobility needs. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about another future issue with you <coughs> for a minute real quick. DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. The president's talking about canceling this program. The U.S. Supreme Court is hearing arguments about it starting this month. This, there could be a ruling here as early as next spring. Your concerns about this from a local and national level? I know you've talked about it before, but here we are right in front of the Supreme Court with this. Yeah, so this, the the U.S. Supreme Court actually heard oral arguments on this last week, right. um, and so we're now ex now everybody's sort of sitting around, holding yeah. our breath, waiting for um, for an opinion. So obviously, the city of Seattle and our region as a whole is uh, home to thousands of DACA recipients. The impact is devastating. It means that they lose their status. It means they lose their job. It means they lose their scholarships. Their ability to continue to be. Um, out of the shadows is mm -hmm. going to be completely lost and they will be at risk of uh, of deportation. Mm -hmm. So we have to continue to fight for the bigger systemic changes, which is comprehensive immigration reform, so that we're giving relief not just to these DACA recipients, but to their families as well. Okay. It's just Mike, so misguided. Yeah. That, and <laughs> it's just unfortunate that, you know, someone's fighting this. That's an ideological battle that's yeah. undermining all the things we yeah, care about yeah. as a country. Absolutely. 22nd version here, Mike. Interesting news about the Showbox. Seattle Theater Group, historic uh, Seattle, putting a bid to buy this building. I know the current owner of that theater has had some back and forth with the city, some, a legal mess here. Mm -hmm. Does this new offer maybe bring some hope to people who want to save the show box. I always thought that we need someone who cares about the music industry to take ownership of that. So if it can be worked out, it'd be amazing. Okay, Loren, I'll end up with you. Just a quick check of how you're feeling. Your baby's due in a matter of weeks. Excited, <laughs> frantic, exhausted. Pick two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> all of all of the above, yeah. mostly uh, mostly excited and looking forward to it, and just want to express gratitude to um, everybody in the city who's been um, so warm and kind to me, um, and and lots of lots of amazing well wishes about the impending parenthood, that mm -hmm. journey that I'm about to embark on. Look at so that big been, smile. It's, all been, right. it's <laughs> been awesome. It makes me happy. It, and it should. And it should <laughs> stay healthy and stay well. Thank, Thank you. you both for your input here, and we will see you next time on Council Edition.